Mining is widespread across the globe, covering thousands of square kilometers of holes in the ground. But can we leverage these golden opportunities for sustainability once resource extraction activities are done and dusted? With a laundry list of grand challenges, we are all called upon each and every day to think of out-of-the-box ways to make our world a more sustainable place. This show is about inspiring individuals and their journey along the cutting edges of science, engineering, technology, and design. I'm your host, Peter Maxbach, and this is the Grand Challenges Podcast. My guest today is Mohan Yelishetti, an Associate Professor in Resources Engineering at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. From an upbringing in the Indian countryside, Mohan embarked on a journey to creating a better image of minerals extraction through diverse and high-impact research that is steadily changing policies and regulations, even beyond the mining sector. In today's episode, we discuss the life cycle of mines and minerals from cradle to cradle and uncover the so-called resources trinity around remining, rehabilitating, and repurposing thousands of holes in the ground. For more information, refer to the show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, Mohan. Good to have you here. Thank you, Peter. I'm really excited. And this was long overdue. And finally, we are here. Thank you so much for that. No, definitely. And we wanted to catch up earlier in the year when I was in Australia, but didn't have the chance. But I'm glad we could do that now. So looking forward. Absolutely. I'm looking forward too. And you're bringing a topic to the podcast that we actually haven't covered at all, but I think is still incredibly relevant to understanding, you know, not only some of the challenges we're facing in urban livability and the threats of climate change on our livelihoods, but also just generally something that often stays hidden from us, which is this whole idea of resources and resource engineering. So it'll be interesting to delve deeper into that topic today and to see how we connect the dots from extracting resources from the ground all the way to our smartphone and then what happens to these resources after that. Absolutely, Peter. I say to any class that I go to, especially when I'm trying to teach the younger generations who come into engineering, especially the resources engineering, not many are forthcoming, but what they don't understand is how critical this industry is. This is fundamental to the growth and prosperity of human societies, whether it is historical, whether it is current. Minerals have been so crucial to our progress and development in fact, uh, the ages were known by the metal that predominated that particular civilization. So as we know, Bronze Age, Copper Age, and so on. So yeah, they're so, so important. Yeah, it's actually interesting when you think about how we've named the ages, as you said, Bronze Age, Copper Age. And I guess oftentimes this kind of area gets a bit of a bad reputation for many reasons. But I think there's a lot that's also being done in this area to be sustainable and to be accommodating to the environmental challenges that we face. And you yourself delve into some of these topics quite passionately. And it's great to see that we have people that step up to these challenges and to really show that it's a critical industry, it's essential for us, and there are ways we can do this sustainably. Yeah, I think I am, a, as you rightly said, I'm a very passionate mining engineer. Also, I consider myself as a dangerous optimist. No. So <laughs> that means something that many people think cannot be done, I think should be done and must be done. So... In that sense, uh, because the way that I came to even my own research philosophy that I currently sort of spearhead is influenced by some of that important underpinnings uh, that I said, okay, there's so much bad publicity or media that goes against mining. And that, uh, yes, there are instances where mining did not do well in terms of fulfilling their obligations. But the current day's mining is very important. Uh, in fact, there's a philosophy that I am very touched by, which says, Anything that you cannot grow naturally must come out of a mine. Just look around, Peter. And there's a wonderful video that I will send you that says, eliminate mining. What you are essentially becoming is an ape. So minerals and minerals derived products are pretty much everywhere when you look around in the room that you are sitting and the room that I'm sitting and the way that we are talking communicating. So they underpin every single technology. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's nice to have that realization and in a way grow that appreciation for, I guess, a lot of the effort that's put into this kinds of practice. To sort of get people into, I guess, knowing who you are, I think one very interesting topic, uh, and this really relates to where you've come from and where you are based currently, you're from India and you're now based in Australia. And it's something that you're also quite passionate about and that also gets quite a bit of media attention, at least in these two countries, is cricket, actually. 
Now, I'm someone who loves to watch sport. I watch Formula One, and when the World Cup is happening, then I, I tend to tune into the games. Otherwise, I, I sort of settle on you know one or two types of sports. But I've been to a cricket match before in Melbourne, actually, and it was a very fascinating sport because I felt like it can go for days and <laughs> you can just sit there and enjoy it. I mean, that's something that really characterizes you as a person who's in touch with your roots as well as where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. AI. Artificial intelligence, I'm not talking of AI, of artificial intelligence, but Australia, India, which I'm really, really passionate about, as you rightly said. And what brings me to Australia, to be honest, Peter, see, I got offers from Canada. Perhaps if I tried, I could have gone to USA or maybe the UK. But what drew my attention was cricket and Australia being one of the top cricketing nations when I was growing up as a child. I always dreamt, hey, if at all I go, I only go to Australia. So, yeah. and I am an avid, of course, follower of cricket. But before that, I am a player by myself. I used to play for my university. I was an opening batsman. And in fact, my professors back in those days, if I had to recall, they would call me a Ravi Shastri. Like the way that I used to bat, I think I always resembled one of the legendary Indian cricketer of those times, Ravi Shastri, one of the opening batsmen. So my style of batting sort of reflected Ravi Shastri. And also some people used to call me Azaharuddin, one of the former Indian captain. So yes, I love cricket. And I'm from Cricketing Nation and I'm working in another Cricketing Nation. I'm living in another Cricketing Nation, which I'm really, truly admire and, you know, love and I'm passionate about. And there can't be any better times to be in this country when the relationships between these two countries is at all time high. And, you know, there's so much of trade, so much of cultural integration and so much of diplomacy happening between the two countries. Yes, I feel very fortunate to be in the right country at the perfect timing. So there can't be anything else that I could wish. I think that game I went to many years ago, I think was Australia versus India. How do you deal with that when you have to watch these kinds of games? Who do you support? <laughs> this is a good question. In fact, um, yes, uh, because, you know, I, first of all, of course, you know, when you go to games as a um, sportsman myself, you know, I enjoy who plays the best game. You know, at the end of the day, the winner is the one who plays or, you know, who demonstrates the best show in that particular game. But I also attended many matches between India versus Australia. And of course, you know, the most exciting match that I ever been to was India versus Pakistan, the T20 match. And it was such a suspense thriller. It was nail biting. And many people, it, it was a jam packed stadium, close to 100,000 people. And the uproar was unimaginable. But the discipline that was demonstrated in this match was absolutely next to none. So that was one of the best match that I ever witnessed being in. And of course, India won. It was thanks to course, Virat right? Kohli. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, it was a match. And in fact, I was sitting next to a Pakistani friend. Uh, so it was shoulder to shoulder. But, uh, you know, it was absolutely no chaos, no altercation, not a single fight. And attended by women, children, you know, youngsters of all ages. So it is such a fantastic event. But again, coming back to your question, so who do I support when India and Australia plays? So first of all, I support the cricket. But at times, you know, my heart goes for, okay, if India is playing well, I cheer up Indian side. If Australia is doing well, I cheer up. So that's the advantage that I have when I'm living in Australia and I was born in India. But yeah, I, I really support the game of cricket more than any team in specific. And it makes it easier to navigate diplomatically as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you, you could have been a cricket star, but uh, you're actually in mining engineering. What made you think to, you know, I guess, give up the dream of cricket and go for environmental engineering, especially in the field of mines? That's another very, very good question. In fact, uh, as a child growing up in a rural India back in 90s and 80s, you know, I always, and again, you know, we used to hear the likes of cricketing Stars like, for example, Sunil Gavaskar, Kapil Dev, you know, and all those superstars of that time. And always you wanted to become one of them, you know, and playing, representing the country. And pretty much you went to any nook and corner of 
India, you would see many youngsters coming together, whether it is sunny day, rainy day, you know, whether it is chilling cold. Cricket was one thing that never stopped when I was growing up. And where would we play? We didn't have the luxury of going to the playgrounds like what you see in Australia. So we used the small roads, which are not uh, heavily kind of used for traffic, etc., so we would put some stumps and then play on the roads themselves. And whenever some vehicle comes, so we pull everything out of that. And so the vehicle passes and again play back. So then my father used to always say, because he knew that I'm not going to make big progress because I belong to a small town. The nearest city would be around 200 kilometers and there was no proper infrastructure. And only 11 people can play for a country, right? Unless you play for the country, you can't succeed, you know, as a cricketing player. Then my father used to always warn me, you must study, you must study my son. And he used to say, you know, like you are spending so much of your precious time playing out, but rather you should put same effort in studies. And also, you know, coming from a very modest background, you don't have that luxury of, okay, if you don't do well at studies, okay, you got a business to look after. No, it was not that position. So either study and get a job or you remain unemployed whole life and then struggle. So that was one of the important decisions that I had to take earlier on. But even in cricket, I really used to play very well. I know if I continued, perhaps I could have represented the country, but I have no regrets doing what I'm doing today. I think, uh, yes, that's exactly the you know tipping point, I would say, you know. When I decided, okay, studies are my mainstay, I think I pursued that path. Again, those days, the competition was very fierce to get into engineering because, you know, India is hugely populated. The competition is very fierce. So, and again, affordability of family also comes to uh, the equation when it comes to, you know, getting into a good university, not a private university because private you will have to pay money. And then, yeah, I've chosen to sit for some competitive exams. I secured high rank and that's how I ended up at a university. And mining those days was considered highly employable compared to any other engineering disciplines in the country because I came from a very mining infested rural background. So we always saw how the mining engineers were treated and, you know, the respect that they commanded and so on and so forth. So that sort of brought me into mining. So you did a Bachelor of Engineering in Mining from Osmania University in Hyderabad, India, before then going to the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, IIT Bombay. They're quite widespread across India, where you did a master's in environmental engineering. And the choice to go into environmental engineering, I remember a previous conversation we had in the past, you mentioned you used to help out in rice paddies growing up. Was this part of the, the inspiration that gave you that passion for, I guess, environment, landscape, especially also in the rural areas where agriculture is quite dominant, aside from mining. Yeah, absolutely. That's spot on. In fact, as I said, I belong to a place called Manthani, which is a small town, but a highly accomplished town in the region, because one of the former prime ministers of India was at one time representative of this particular town. And many people have migrated to the United States, the UK, you know, Australia, a number of different countries and settled. So that itself is a rural, because the capital city, of that province is about 225, 230 kilometers away. And then my grandparents' house is another, say, 20 to 30 kilometers away from my hometown, which is completely agrarian-based. Like, you know, the agriculture is the mainstay of that rural town. That's a village, not even town. So Mantani was a town where I grew up, where I was born, and then the other place called Upatla. So that place is mainly agriculture. And two of my uncles were agriculturists. They were landlords and they were literally doing agriculture. So whenever we had any smallest vacation, my heart would not go to any city, but my heart would go to that rural village. And those days, again, you know, we are talking of 80s and 90s. So communications were not good enough. The road networks were not good enough. And the infrastructure was poor. And country itself was poor those days. So I used to go by bullock cart with my uncle back to the village. And I used to love, you know, the days would pass, months would pass, years would pass, but I would never want to come back to school. You know, That's a kind of longing I had for that village upbringing. And I used to have barefoot walking. Can you believe this? I couldn't afford, you know, a kind of proper footwear those days, 1980s and 90s kind of thing. And I wanted to go with my uncle to farms, paddies. And literally, I performed every single activity that a farmer would do 
You know, I used to like bulls. I used to love cows. I used to play with them. And I literally did everything, including sowing the seeds and doing harvesting. That's how I was so passionate about being close to nature. And that exactly was one of the reasons why I wanted to do something to save the Mother Earth from further degradation, etc. That really had a huge influence on what I do today. I know the the good feeling of walking barefoot in nature. I tend to sometimes do that in rivers. Actually, just yesterday I was jogging and it was really hot. It's quite hot in Europe at the moment. And I just came across the shoreline of one of the local rivers and I said, all right, I'm just going to take off my shoes and just dip them in the river for now and try and cool off. And yeah, the feeling of just being in touch with nature. I mean, it, it is a thing for those who haven't really tried it. I highly recommend just, you know, if you're walking one day and you come across the river or any other place, just take off your shoes, walk around and just enjoy the feeling. Yeah, I used to take dips. Like I learned swimming by myself. If you are to learn swimming, you must jump into waters, right? That's true. So I did that just by myself. There was no trainer, no teacher. But again, I don't want to say that everyone should do that because that was very unsafe. If something should go wrong, no. You should do everything that is safe enough and then only you should venture into these. But uh, yes, it's spectacular. You know, I, I wanted to go back and live another life in that childhood, which I really feel miss. A great period of your life that you like mm. to reminisce about. And so agriculture into mining. In a way, you just mentioned already, you want to protect Mother Earth, you want to protect the nature. I guess that is one area where you can really make some significant impact. Also, you mentioned the job market for that was pretty good at the time. But after completing your master's, you hung around a bit for a while, but then you pursued a PhD in Australia at Monash University, which you then completed in 2010. What made you make that change? You've sort of mentioned that if you would go anywhere, it would be Australia because of that relation with cricket. But why did you then decide to venture out and also to stay in this academic route? Because as far as I understand, the mining industry also has a lot of good job opportunities in consulting companies, mining companies as well. Yeah, so one thing that surely happened was I was attending a conference at one of the IITs. Those days, we only had six IITs, but now there are about 20 IITs in the country. So IIT stands for Indian Institute of Technology. So I went to a conference. Uh, there was a mining conference in IIT Kharagpur. And that's where I met Professor Ranjit Patagama from Monash University. He was a senior lecturer at the time. Uh, he was one of the delegates. I'm talking of 2006. So that time, after I completed my master's from IIT Bombay, I was working for government of Goa at a polytechnic teaching mining engineering. And then I also went to attend this along with my wife. And apparently my wife and Professor Ranjit were sitting on the same seat. Like we were going for a gala dinner. So they were transferring us from the guest house to the venue in a kind of bus. And then in the kind of very casual talk, they both discussed about uh, tulips. For some reason, the tulips came. And then Professor Ranjit seems to have said, oh, there are so many tulips in Australia. Then, you know, I said, I think, you know, the whole discussion. And then I met him at the dinner and he said, uh, yeah, if you want, you know, there could be some scholarships that I could try to come to Australia to do PhD. So, yeah, the whole thing started off with uh, that conference and that gala dinner that I attended. <laughs> and it's all because of tulips. <laughs> <laughs> tulips. <laughs> yes, that brought us to Australia. In fact, to be very honest, when we came, like many migrants, we didn't know anything. And we didn't even had an idea that I could settle here, that there was something called permanent residency. So we came mm. to do PhD and then go back. So it so became the things were unfolding and Eventually, we found our second home, the beautiful country. And fast forward many years, you are still there and yes. associate professor now at Monash and really leading the charge in sustainable mining. Absolutely. I'm so passionate about it. And sometimes I can't even sleep, you know, because at times I get dreams, oh, I should do this tomorrow. Then until tomorrow, I can't sleep. <laughs> so in a way, interesting journey, but definitely connected to your passions and tulips, which is I didn't expect that. But yeah, there are some very interesting events in Australia where you can see different flowers. I think I've heard of that when I used to live there. Yeah, especially in Melbourne. Yes, it is the city of a lot of events. So mm -hmm. many things happen there. So for those who have never been there, I definitely recommend spending a few months there. You won't regret it. But you're now in sustainable mining. You have, in a way, kickstarted a whole range of thematics around the topic. But in a way, when you started your PhD, you looked into the aspects of understanding 
understanding the cycle, the life cycle of materials, in particular, this idea of life cycle assessment. For those who don't know, a life cycle assessment is a quantitative approach where you really analyze what happens from the cradle. So when the raw material is taken from the ground through to the grave, so when it becomes a product, and then finally when it's disposed off to understand what happens to it, what happens to the balance of the biosphere, and also the other implications of it. So economic implications, but also other kinds of implications. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Life cycle is, uh, nowadays, we have coined cradle to cradle. Hmm. There was a time where we would say cradle to grave. That means everything that took birth would again get landfilled. We cannot do that because that's very unsustainable. Yeah. So that's where the circularity and the concepts are getting very popular. So everything that we do, every action that we do today has a consequence on how it's going to impact on our environment, whether it is land, water, or the climate change, for example. So the life cycle is exactly trying to understand where, like you do life cycle inventory, that's where you understand what are the resources intensities that go in into each of the life cycle stages of a product. For example, the microphones that we are speaking into consists of several metals, for example, let us say, or for that matter, number of components that are made out of different minerals, minerals derived products, and also some plastics. So in each of these in making, you've got certain inputs that go into making, whether it is water intensity, whether it is energy intensity, whether it is material intensity. So life cycle inventory is nothing but just taking stock of what goes in and what comes out. And how we can cycle it around into something exactly. else. And yeah. also what carbon emissions that we are going to release, what greenhouse gases are going to come out. And you know, when you have this understanding, what you can then do is, okay, when you see certain hotspots, you try to work on them and then try to mitigate the impacts of that by taking some corrective measures. So that's exactly the philosophy of life cycle assessment. And just to put things into perspective, these minerals can be things like nickel, gallium, germanium, different elements that you find. If you take a periodic table, some of these elements that you find are going to be quite rare and quite important for electronic products or different kinds of other products. I'm just thinking computers and smartphones. I just looked up some interesting stats. For example, a computer microprocessor usually requires around or more than 60 different minerals to manufacture or a smartphone or many consumer phones have about 42. So it's, it's quite a huge number. I guess when people look at their phones, don't just think of it as a body of metal. There's actually a lot more that goes into it. It's like cooking. Absolutely. That is spot on, Peter. That's exactly, you know, when we started mining engineering a resources engineering program at Monash. In fact, I was one of the founding academics back in 2013. First couple of years, we had good response from the students and then students were admitted. And then what happened is gradually the interest started dying. We saw that. Then we took that as a task and then we not only were waiting for students to come, but we went out to schools in around Melbourne and also in the regional areas, mainly to canvas. Hey, mining is so important. Without mining, the society will come to literally a still. Like if we did not back then, for example, in Victoria, 60 to 80% energy came out of burning coal, for example. So that was, again, mining. And as you rightly said, a microprocessor or energy transition, for example. Today, we are talking of climate change mitigation, and we require a number of these offshore, onshore wind, solar panels. So anything that we are trying to build is comprising of a lot of metals. So they must be mined. And then we used to tell them, you know, it's a very important industry to be in. But, you know, eventually there was lack of interest from students. So we had to abandon the program, a fantastic program. Okay, now that's a pity. Mm. But in a way, I think maybe people understand more intricately what's involved. I think this shed light on just the complexity in creating a sustainable practice around mining as well. I did hear that also in 2013, around that time when I was also in Australia, there was a pretty big mining boom. So I guess the economy has had a bit of a role to play and maybe some of that loss of interest as well. Yeah, absolutely. I spoke at a lecture that I recently gave at Melbourne Uni. Why people are behind electric vehicles? Let's do some number crunching here. A typical electric vehicle versus an IC engine counterparts. An internal combustion engine. If you look at 
electric vehicle requires six times more minerals or minerals derived product in its making. Oh, wow. But if you look at the life cycle emissions of IC engine compared to an electric vehicle, an IC engine typically in its entire life cycle from the time it is getting manufactured through to finally discarded into kind of recycled metal pieces, it emits about, let's say, 55 ton of carbon equivalents. If that is a total emission, a typical electric vehicle would only emit 35 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, like, you know, greenhouse emissions. The majority of that 35 is contributed from the electricity that it uses in recharging. Mm. And that electricity is predominantly the carbon intensive electricity. Should that electricity mix be changed with the more renewables, then that emission, you know, the life cycle emission of an electric vehicle would be far, far less. That's exactly the reason why people are trying to go for, you know, kind of electric vehicles or renewable energies. Of course, they have high material intensity, but in the overall, they would be more environmentally friendly compared to the other technologies that we currently are using. I was actually going to say 55 to 35 isn't, I guess, that big a difference for six times the amount of minerals requirements. But when you think about it, it's not because of the car itself, but because of the fuel that's needed for that car. So in other words, electricity, then I guess it really puts things into perspective, replace it with renewables, and you can almost drop it down to near zero, I guess. Yeah, if not zero, at least uh, maybe one third of what a typical IC engine counterpart would produce. But nevertheless, I guess if you want to be a mining engineer, it's also very critical to understand these cycles, the life cycle of different materials that go into and where they end up. One concept that I thought would be interesting to sort of bring up here is this idea of open loop versus closed loop recycling, which in a way you've talked a bit about in your critical review that you did about life cycle assessment that I thought was quite critical to know because metals can be recycled. So you put them into your smartphones and other devices, but once these devices reach the end of life, these kinds of minerals can be extracted again and reused elsewhere. And this brings into the discussion the concepts, I guess, of open loop versus closed loop. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a brilliant uh, way that you put it in. If you look at, by definition, metals are infinitely recyclable, unless otherwise there are some fugitive losses. For example, if you look at a typical car, which weighs about two tons yeah. from the time it is manufactured to the time it comes to end of its life. But what happens is there is a shelf life of these vehicles. So once they are into anthroposphere, we call it, right? From lithosphere, you extract minerals, metals, and then you put that into form and shape that it becomes a vehicle. A vehicle is used depending on you know whether it is a developed country or underdeveloped country. So generally, give and take, plus or minus 30 years is its life, let's say. So for that 30 years, it is going to be in use. And then it would come to end of its life. And then that's when it is crushed and then put back into electric car furnaces. If you look at the recyclability of majority of mainstream metals, again, this is one thing that we need to appreciate the human endeavor. We have been really good at recycling for a number of reasons. One, from my memory, a typical one ton of iron, if you are to produce from iron ore to iron, uh, or steel would typically about three tons of, of carbon dioxide equivalent. But whereas if you are producing the steel out of recycled material, you would only end up producing maybe half of what you would generally do from primary ores. So that's a very economic and environmental motivation why people do recycling. Recycling is cheaper and it is more environmentally friendly. So there are those advantages. And yes, uh, as I said, you know, iron and steel, you look at copper, you look at aluminum, you look at lead zinc, the recycling efficiency have been terrific. So again, all that stems from the premise that metals are recyclable infinite times, unless you lose them. Maybe in some occasions, you know, maybe certain alloying agents could make it hard to separate and then you may not use, you know, because that level of purity that you want to achieve in metals by recycling, you could not achieve. So that may be prohibitive, but otherwise, in most cases, it can be done quite efficiently. And the difference between an open and the closed loop is also where that metal ends up if it's within the same system. I guess to put it in simple terms, if you have a particular mineral that is used for a smartphone first, and then eventually when it gets recycled, it goes elsewhere. 
say, into a car, that would essentially be an open loop, right? Yeah, probably we could say so. It is a slightly loosely defined territory. So yeah, you could say that open loops and closed loops are, you know, like in the same system. For example, you know, you could even say that within the continent boundaries, if it could be done, oh, okay. so that's also closed loop. But yeah, it could range from whether it is the industry that you're trying to specifically mention or whether it is the geography that you're trying to specifically mention. Hmm. And I guess it puts some perspective that when we think of open loop, closed loop, it's not just about what that material is used for, but I guess the whole institution around the recycling practice, whether it happens in the country or whether it's within a single company or entity versus if it's cross-boundary or cross-country or cross-institution. Absolutely. But I guess one of the critical things you pointed out, and this was already back in 2009, was that lifecycle assessment is a useful tool because it can help support policy development because you're really understanding what's happening to the materials as it goes from cradle to cradle. As you rightfully point out, we're in the age of circularity and we need to think about that. When I still learned the topic back in undergraduate, they still called it cradle to grave. So how times have changed and it's great to see a rapid change in also the mentality and the thinking around the environment. But you mentioned it was a very useful policy tool, but suffered from a whole range of issues when we're trying to apply this to the mining industry. From your paper specifically, there were a few key things. We kind of talked about the open closed loop recycling and it was related to how we characterize that. But other dimensions also included the land use impacts as well, because it's not just about the material, but I guess what happens as a result of the activities. It was also about the spatial and the temporal dimensions. So these assessments tend to assume things are quite static, they're quite simplified. And I guess you have to, because because we need a lot of data to run these kinds of analysis. Yeah, exactly. In fact, one of the very famous professors used to always say, I think you yourself used to hold this particular viewpoint that garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah. So, so data is the key underpinning for any evaluations to be made or any judgments have to be passed on. Availability of the data, because back then, perhaps not many companies were forthcoming in sharing their data, which are very commercial in confidence in nature, which are, you know, very protective. Mm. But now, now that some of these have become mandatory declarations, people are happy to share this data and publish and, you know, do some kind of modeling. But again, in LCA is conducted for a variety of different reasons. Companies do it to do a bit of auditing of their own processes and methodologies. But whereas that's kind of change-oriented or goal-oriented. So people have used this as a tool to inform their own internal policies. And now increasingly more people are coming to terms to use this because that's really giving a lot of insights into where they're going wrong. It's all about energy efficiency, resource efficiency. That matters because the cost of production pressures are pretty much everywhere. So everyone is trying to internalize some of these tools to their own advantage. Yeah. And I guess, have we improved from when you wrote that review back in 2009? Do we have more advanced techniques now to be a bit more objective or transparent? Because in a way, your biggest criticism was its subjectivity. Yeah. So now the methodologies have been developed quite robust because that was very early stages of LCA, but now people have been using it. More data is available. So there's much more broader scope and application of LCA. Yes, it's much more robust, I must say. Yeah. And there are many softwares. Which, for example, Sima Pro is one of that. Gabby is another one. EcoInvent. These have been developed with strong database at the core in its making. Yeah, that's good to hear. And I guess with the advent of more data and more unconventional sources of data, they might find their way into improving these techniques further. I want to take a step, well, it's not really back, but I want to take a step back to illustrate what sort of goes on in the mining industry. So say I had a, I run a big mining company and I want to actually open up or get a permit to mine certain minerals from the ground. What's the common procedure around this whole process, around the life cycle of a mine or a mining project? An excellent question, Peter, because again, mining is a vast subject and its nature changes from each jurisdiction if you may say so. For example, the way mining is done in Australia is different to the way it is done in India, to the way it is done in Vietnam, to the way it is being done in a number of African countries to Canada and so on. I should have assumed there is no one size fits all because given the politics around it and the economics, every country should have their own procedure. You're being most familiar with the Australian context. I can't just take a shovel and start digging a hole in Australia. What are the steps I have to walk through? 
given which jurisdiction that you want to operate, there are certain basic principles in which mining activities should be conducted or undertaken. For example, you know, you start off with some kind of exploration. First of all, you need to find out what is in the ground at a particular leasehold area. Mm -hmm. So only once their feasibility has been thoroughly established, then only the mining development will commence. So exploration is the basic precursor activity. So there are so many different phases, we call them pre-scoping level studies, scoping level studies, pre-feasibility level studies, and feasibility level studies. So all of that essentially are making sure that you are getting more accurate information about a particular prospect. So then you go from exploration to development to mining to processing, and then the kind of whether it is export or whether it is refining or smelting that happens onshore. So that's a typical life cycle of a mining or mineral derived product. But essentially, if you look at Australia, generally we are very good at the exploration. We are good at developing mines, commissioning the mines and exploiting the reserves that are in the ground. So generally, this whole process could take anywhere between five to 10 years before the mine actually is commissioned. Okay. Uh, the digging could happen because you have to go through so many approvals, whether it's a state level or federal level. Although mining is slightly, you know, falls over into two jurisdictions like state and federal. In Australia, it is pretty much a state purview it comes under and then the leases are accorded to whoever is willing to undertake this mining activity at a particular location. So the exploration phase, this is really about understanding the spatial relationships. First of all, looking at, I guess, geological maps. Say I want to make my own smartphone company and I need to find those minerals. I would explore the geology of the landscape and then I'll say, oh, here's some, you know, some interesting points. And I guess the next steps would be the economics around it as well. I mean, can I access the site? What's required? How deep is it? As well as things like how can I process it? Can I build a plant there? Do I have to send it somewhere? Uh, so there's a lot of thought that goes into this, really this first stage before you can then even get to applying for a permit or permission to even just start digging. Yeah, I think uh, you nailed it perfectly. So generally explorers are different people compared to miners. So there are many exploration companies. They discover the ores. And when you find a good prospect, that's when you enter into a joint venture with a company which is into mining, which is mainly digging stuff out of the ground. Mm. So I think there are, from memory, exploration licenses are given from five to 10 years kind of terms. And then mining licenses are given for 25 years, kind of maximum tenure. That uh, okay. if you are a mining license holder, you will get about 25 years, but extendable. Like if you did a good job and if you followed all the rules and regulations, perhaps that could be extendable. Yeah. Like uh, there are many exploration companies, but there are also a few mining companies because mining is a very capital intensive because you need big machines, you know, big processing facilities and you need markets. All of that has to go into the planning as well. So the logistics around it, once you find your site, you need to figure out what equipment you need. And I guess also key here is to distinguish between a mine so digging a deep shaft and going down to extract the minerals. And I guess what you also work with a lot, quarries. So where you're actually just digging the hole into the ground and then mining the materials on the surface. And these quarries can look pretty massive when you look in the landscape. You can view them from satellite imagery. If you're flying over certain locations, I was just in Gran Canaria for a holiday and I spotted a quarry from the plane. These you will not miss. Absolutely. I think you were spot on. So in generally, like we say, mining could be underground and it could be open cut. Ah, that's the, yeah, that's the terminology. Quarry is a specific term that we use for mainly the dimensional stone mining or you know any constructional material that you want to derive. So that's a specific term used for quarries. But mining is either underground or surface. So you were referring to the big open cuts where you've got a big hole in the ground, which is exactly what you said you would have seen a number of times looking out of your window in an aeroplane. You have to pardon my ignorance, I'm not a mining engineer. And we have collaborated in the past, but it doesn't mean I've picked up all the terminology and the full understanding yet. But yeah, good to clarify, open cut versus underground mines. And one important thing, Peter, I must say here, not many deposits that are often found which are shallow lying mm. because it's economics that makes whether you want to work it open cut or underground. Okay. So as the deposits are getting deeper and deeper, the only option is 
go underground uh, because all the shallow lying deposits have been already done away. Yeah, I guess the shallow ones would have been the first opportunities for the takers. Mm. Uh, and now we have to go deeper and deeper to find the more rare deposits. And then this becomes a whole balancing act of cost benefit, the whole effort to dig versus the yields you can get and the value it brings to society from mm. what you extract. Sure. And so in a way we go through this life cycle and you have sort of contributed on different aspects of the life cycle. In particular, you've made a recent attempt to actually improve the way we explore the site, the location of the mine, and being able to identify opportunities for these activities. And in a way, it's been previously very geological, but a study you did recently really looked at developing a geospatial tool that actually helps guide this decision process, weighing up the geological and the economic and other aspects quite equally. Yeah, I think that's an exciting project that we were called into. Back in 2017, I remember taking a delegation to Geoscience Australia because uh, I mean, I co-published a paper with one of the colleagues at GA. And as a consequence, our relationship grew from strength to strength over a period of time. And this project was mainly part of their Exploring for the Future program, which GA back then, it was one of their flagship programs mainly to explore Northern Australia. So that's exactly where myself and my colleague, academic Dr. Stuart Walsh at Monash University and Dr. Stephen Northey, who was my former PhD student, and now he works at University Technology of Sydney, UTS. So he's one of the gems that I've seen in the academia. So we were trying to come up with this geospatial model to assess regional economic viability for mineral resource development. So, in fact, we published that paper in, I think, uh, Resources Policy, if I'm correct. So, the main paper, we introduced a numerical model aimed at identifying the economic fairways. So, mainly areas permissive to mineral development from an economic perspective. The model, Blue Cap itself, combines large-scale infrastructure and geological data sets to conduct geospatial economic viability of mining operations across Australia. So this was mainly aimed at identifying the base metals. So if you are an investor sitting in Switzerland, for example, if you want to look at where to invest for a lead zinc deposit, let's say, this is a tool which is algorithm-driven. So where in a you know, number of models that are underpinning this algorithm development, you adjust some of the parameters and then it will give you what is the net present value. So it's a kind of pre-scoping level study that would tell whether that particular deposit of lead zinc sitting somewhere in Mount Isa region, is it worth? Because you may have, let, let me put it this way, you may have a best of the deposit in the outback yep. where you don't have proper infrastructure, you don't have ways to, you know, keep people employed and, you know, even people are also key, right, in mining. That is true. Finding people and then, you know, locating the mine and then putting the entire infrastructure, that would make it too expensive for that particular deposit to be mined. So this is exactly what it does, you know, it overlays all of that and then tells you it will produce a heat map, whether that is promising or not. So kind of very macro level of kind of feasibility is what uh, this particular model was aimed at. But in a way, it allows the business case for the mining to be then pitched against other kinds of competing land uses for that particular space. And it provides, uh, I guess, the strong economic but also geological argument that certain sites identified are, in a way, the best places to go for and to start with. Yeah, absolutely. Which improves upon a lot of the previously static analyses that also often tend to focus on the geological first without thought for the people that have to work there, the infrastructure that needs to be built there. So in a way, it's a uh, much more... I guess, strategic approach that you've then brought into the assessment. Yeah, because all of this is not new to mining industry, but uh, what would happen is even this level of analysis would happen at a cost for a mining company. Mm. So now what GA has done is they plug that into their portal. So if you are an investor sitting in Switzerland, again, want to understand at a very macro level, where should I open my next lead zinc mine? So you could do that using this tool. Mm. And then anyway, after that, you will commission kind of pre-feasibility, feasibility and bankable feasibility studies, again, at a cost. So this is at no cost. Yeah. And this cost is borne by GA through that funded project at Monash. So in a way, it automates a process that otherwise is a very costly and timely process. 
and just allows you to be more efficient. Absolutely. And I guess that's really the starting point in the whole mining journey. But then you obtain your permits, you get your infrastructure and you set up the logistics. Perhaps the critical aspect, which is what I'd like to get to, which is also your current and really strong piece of research, is what you do once your permit is done, once you've mined what you can, and now you leave the site or you decommission the site. You've just left the giant hole in the ground. Yes. If it's an open cut. Or you've left this big shaft into a, an underground mine. And yeah, it's like out of sight, out of mind almost. Pun not intended, maybe intended. But essentially, these mines end up being abandoned or neglected. There are a whole range of terms that can be used. And yeah, in a way, a recent study published by a mutual colleague of us that we've worked with as well actually identified when they analyzed the Earth's surface that there's about 66 thousand square kilometers of visible sites across the globe. Eventually, some of these are going to be abandoned already. Others are going to be in the near future. We ourselves, when we collaborated on this one little project, identified around 80,000 such abandoned mines in Australia itself. And so you've taken an approach to try and address this serious problem because at the same time, it presents a golden opportunity. And you've done this from a standpoint that you term the resource trinity. Absolutely. Yeah, this is another thing that I was very passionate about because when I started my career back in 2011 after my PhD in Australia teaching at Monash's uh, Gippsland campus, we tailored a lot of point solutions to help mining industry address the rehab. That's the process, you know, after the end of life, trying to put it back to pre-mining ecosystem is called rehabilitation. In fact, that was the time where I was taking students on excursions and I realized, oh, there's a huge potential to synergize different industries that coexist in the same region. That's called Latro Valley. Mm -hmm. So we came up with an idea to develop something called artificial topsoils. So when I saw that mines have got a problem of rehabilitation, but they are falling short of good quality fertile soils to aid them in rehabilitation efforts. And then power plant produces a lot of fly ash, which is getting landfilled. Again, it has a problem. And then there was Australian pulp and paper mill in Maryville. So they used to also have some wood chips discarded, which were getting landfilled. And next to that was a water factory, which used to treat domestic sewage and then produce a lot of sewage sludge. Then I spotted, oh, brilliant. Let's bring the waste streams from three, four different industries. That is mines, power plant, paper industry, and this water factory. I guess they say one person's waste is another person's treasure. There you go. Spot on. Even more critical nowadays as well. Absolutely. So what we did is we just combined. And in fact, that time I recruited one of my undergrad students. He was doing his final year project with me, Michael Taylor. Very smart chap. What he did, I told him, hey, bring all these waste streams. Put some trial plots and then I think he did it on his own personal farm. Oh. <laughs> uh, because, you know, we had to go through a lot of approvals. Yeah. Then we said, okay, let's uh, skip that. And then I think he put some buckets. We One of my colleagues back then, she gave buckets, you know, at no cost because her husband used to work somewhere. And they used to have all these plastic buckets. And yeah, he put a number of these. We had to produce every particular composition in either triplicate or quadruplicates. And then... He grew grasses on these soils that uh, they were mixed in different proportions. Ah, that's interesting. And yeah, and then he, at the time when he presented that, when it came to the final year project presentations, I invited some industry folks and he brought these buckets, which are full of lush green <laughs> no, grasses. Oh, wow. So that was the point solutions we were providing. Then I said, okay, while providing point solutions is the object too, then I a little bit uh, looked at, okay, let us understand what is happening at a regional scale or at a country scale. And that's when uh, one other student back in, again, fast forward to 2014, 15, Alec Miller, another smart student at Clayton campus came in. And then we started off with Victoria as a state. Let us uh, bring all these databases together and use GIS to do a bit of mapping. And he did a spectacular job, Peter, can you believe? And he developed a good framework for Victoria. And in subsequent years after that, we recruited additional students who looked at Queensland, who looked at New South Wales, who looked at Western Australia, South Australia, and we completed the whole country. And that's exactly where I met you, if I remember correctly. And I remember we had a coffee. I was just about to leave for Switzerland and pitched me this idea. And I said, hey, you could do this or that, suggesting the odd GIS technique and also multi-criteria decision analysis to try and 
pieced together all the different data sets. And a few years later, we actually co-published a, a paper together. My only paper in mining, but something I'm definitely proud of because I definitely learned a lot from that. It's funny to see the innovation start in someone's backyard. Like we know many other famous stories of the innovation beginning in someone's backyard or garage. So absolutely, kind of a fairy tale story. And so fast forward a few years, we in a way have to deal with rehabilitation. This initial work that really identified that we have 80,000 different occurrences. They have many different spatial relationships, but there's a whole range of opportunities to rehabilitate them. It has actually caught the media's attention and you've been featured quite widely for this topic on the media as well, in Australia as well as overseas. But in a way, you said we need some structure. You brought some structure to this particular challenge. And that's what you really call the resources trinity. Yeah, we have this staggeringly large number of abandoned or inactive mine sites in the country through our research that we found. But uh, on the other side, okay, We've got so many holes in the ground, but on the other side, the number of mines in the country have an ongoing issue of rehabilitation because mining companies don't see rehabilitation as valuable because, you know, they have to spend money. They don't gain any money. Oh. And we also got a lot of tailing stamps because if you look at the many coal mines and power plants, next to them are ash ponds. Likewise, there are many tailing ponds sitting across the country. Tailings are nothing but when you extract a mineral out of the ground or ore out of the ground, what you do, Peter, is you crush, you grind mm -hmm. to a talcum powder consistency, let's say. Oh, wow. Yeah, because you need to separate a metal from non-metal, which we call as gang minerals. Okay. So in that process, let me give you some idea of you know, what percentages or what grades are we speaking of today. Typically, when you talk about aluminum, the crustal concentration is about 8%. But in a typical ore deposit, you may be lucky to get about 30% aluminum. That it becomes your ore body. Okay. Then iron ore, the crustal concentration is about 5.8%, let's say. What's a crustal concentration? Any place that you pick up a dirt and then when you do analysis of that, you would find minimum, you know, about an average of eight, 5 to 8% iron. Gotcha. So in a way, crustal is a random sample you draw from the ground, what you would find, whereas the ores would be expected to have much higher concentrations. Absolutely. Yeah. And then likewise, if you look at lead, 10 ppm and 1%. And likewise, gold is 4 ppb, 4 parts per million and 5 grams per ton. Jeez, that's very, very low. Yes. I guess that's why we, you know, when there's a gold rush, people really rush to try. No, but the, the, back in those yeah. days, Peter, you must uh, understand, we had very luxury of high grades. Uh -huh. Today, we are talking of very, very low lean grades. Uh, times have changed. Resource scarcity. Times have changed. Absolutely. True. So what's happening is when you have got five grams per ton of gold, that means the enrichment factor is about 12,500 times. So 1,250 times you need to enrich to be able to get the carrots of gold that you want. Oh, geez. I can imagine that is a lot of process, a lot of energy investment, a lot Water, of logistics. Water, energy, logistics. Oh, geez. Yep. Yeah. So five grams is only gold out of one ton of rock that you dug out. <laughs> oh my God, that's insane. That means the rest that you finally ground and crushed becomes something called tailings. Okay, so it's like you buy a pack of you know mixed nuts and raisins and you pour it into a bowl and you just pick out the raisins and the rest Absolutely. is essentially your tailings in your fruit bowl or in your nut bowl. That's exactly, I think that, that puts uh, you, it you nailed it so well. And I guess the tailings themselves, I mean, if you're just looking for one mineral, you might find other things in there, but it seems like you don't care about it and it's just sitting there ground up in fine powder. Absolutely. That was back then. So now when we understood this, let's say, okay, here you got 80,000 abandoned mines and you got these tailing stamps. And now on the other side, mining companies are struggling to fulfill their obligation of rehabilitation. That's where we said, hey, can we go back and remine or give rebirth to one of these abandoned mines and start extracting the valuable metals. Because if you looked at metal association with minerals, there's one mainstream metal, but there are many companion metals. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, Peter, with the critical minerals being the hot subject areas, people are trying to find. And these are the metals which we never bothered some 10, 15 years ago. Now, Increasingly, there's more awareness because they possess some spectacular characteristics. That's why people are behind these metals. And by critical, you're referring to those that are, first of all, 
quite scarce are becoming incredibly essential because our industry is evolving. And just look at the electronics industry. There you go. We need to reach upon these minerals. And in a way, they're just potentially just sitting there in all these tailings dams. Absolutely. And that's where we said, hey, by recovering some of these valuable metals that we left behind, we are doing two things. One, we are helping environment. Yeah. Two, we are creating additional revenue stream. So that would help offset some of your rehabilitation obligations. So it's a win-win. Cleaning the environment in which these assets remained in perpetuity. And on the other side, you are creating value by valorizing some of these bases. No, that's fascinating. Because that's also, if you look at, uh, Peter, other important thing that I want to share here for our viewers is we need massive materials if we have to meet climate change, if we have to mitigate the bad impacts of climate change quickly, fastly. Okay. And we need from variety of different sources, whether it is recycling, whether it is primary mining, whether it is remining of some of these old things. So that's a, that's where this concept of resources trinity came from. So mines, tailings, and critical minerals offer solutions. Nice. I see that that completes the trinity. So in a way, we have to do the activity to produce products that I think then can help combat climate change. I'm just thinking solar panel here. What would a typical solar panel manufacturing involve in terms of the mineral requirements? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question again. So solar panels are made out of a number of different, again, metals, metal intensity, anywhere from silica to silver to indium to gallium to germanium to tellurium to cadmium to chromium. You name any metal, it's present in one or the other form, including aluminium, yep. because, you know, the entire structure. But the technology is changing fast. So that means people are trying to find how we can reduce, because, you know, thanks to some of our material scientists, they are always on the front foot when it comes to finding alternatives and finding efficient ways to meet some of these demand. And we'll definitely have to put a bit of a, an ingredients list into the show notes. I think it'd be interesting to see. But I just looked up solar panels and it seems like, you know, some of these minerals are not much different from what we use for a smartphone, for example. And there'll be some exceptions. And so, I, you know, on the one hand, reusing these tailings or reaccessing these tailings to really get these critical minerals to help build technology that can mitigate climate change or help support us to adapt to it. And at the same time, reduce the impact that these tailings dams and just the, the abandoned site has on the environment itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we are going to need these metals in more and more quantities because everyone is trying to accelerate the climate change mitigation. That means all the countries at the same time are looking to source as many of these metals as possible. But not everyone is fortunately blessed with the mineral endowment that Australia is blessed with. Yeah. So, in fact, I was making a presentation last week at Melbourne Uni. I was saying, you know, if you look at the percentage of metals that are going to be needed for battery making, you know, Australia is blessed with pretty much every metal that you're going to need in batteries, starting from lithium to cobalt to copper to bauxite to graphite. Pretty much we have everything. But I guess where it's locked up and if we can access it in also existing what we call them, abandoned occurrences or existing incidences of mining activities. Absolutely. Apart from the minerals, I mean, that's just one big argument for rehabilitation efforts and also why mining companies should invest in rehabilitation efforts. Apart from that, there's a famous book I remember we were trying to track down back in 2020 when we were touching upon this subject area. And that was 101 things to do with a hole in the ground. I think it's out of print, but it can certainly be researched on the internet. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. But there are so many more ways you can use this abandoned site for beneficial uses. I think the most common one that has also been in the news is in Shanghai, the Intercontinental Hotel was built into an old quarry. So they turned the entire pit into a luxury hotel. I know in the UK as well, one of the first examples of ecotourism that was done by the Eden Project was turning this abandoned mine into a, an education center. So we've had more recreational uses for these abandoned occurrences. But there's a whole other range of different examples as well that are actually gaining some interesting attention across the world. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. That's very interesting that you brought up that book. It's a lovely book, right? We used to refer it to quite a lot. In fact, my other good colleague, Professor David Whittle, he sourced it from somewhere. You managed to track down a copy, which is yeah, absolutely. well done. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, that's another repurposing. And uh, that's where you helped me to 
bring in the multi-criteria decision analysis into the game. So now we identified this 80,000 holes and we, in fact, you were one of the people who were involved in naming it as MIDAS, the scheme that we developed. We titled these 80,000 mines and categorized into different groupings. I guess uh, when you have 80,000 points, you kind of need a system to to classify them in. And that was what we had some fun developing. I remember we had to put the the name to a vote. I I have a habit of trying to make up funny names for things I develop. But yeah, Yeah. Midas, Midas, I guess we call it the Midas touch because of the relationship to Greek mythology. Anything that it touches turns to gold. But it stands for the Mining Incidents Documentation and Assessment Scheme. Absolutely. In fact, we call you know that meeting as a naming ceremony. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we all caught up on Zoom and I think you came up with this idea. And then we had a voting and then I think finally we agreed to pass this. That was quite ceremonial. That was great. <laughs> yeah. The fun of being a researcher, you know, you get to do these kinds of quirky little things. Yeah. We came up with this classification scheme, 80,000 mm. occurrences, all sorted into these different categories. Yeah. So the next phase was, okay, just identifying problem is not what scientists are good at. You know, Probably journalists also can do that, finding a problem. But what we did is, now that we have, how can we convert this liability into an opportunity? And we are in such an opportune time to be able to do that. So one out one things to do with a hole in ground is only scratching the surface. There are so many things because back then this particular book was written, all these new uses were never into play. But today we are talking of energy storage. For example, we were approached by a colleague who just started back then, or even in the process of starting a company. And now that company has become really global, green gravity. If you remember, we had a meeting with the founder and the CEO, Mm. Mr. Mark Swinitron. So yeah, it was such a fantastic idea. It's simple, gravity, gravity as the means and how renewable energy could be stored. Because one of the problems, Peter, with renewable energy is you can only produce solar power when there's sun, but you are not going to need so much power at the time when it is produced. Yeah. That means your consumption is going to peak up at the night times, but whereas your production is going to peak up when there's sun around. So that means there's a bit of imbalance between when it is produced, when it is consumed. So that means Mm -hmm. we need storage. And this technology that they are developing is very cool. And at the same time, it's so simple technology. It uses abandoned mine shafts and I guess the power of gravity to then help store this energy as a result of it. Absolutely. And that energy can then be released when it's needed. And now currently they're only looking at underground shafts as means to store energy. But now they are even contemplating whether big holes in the ground, which are open cuts, could be also used. Yeah, potentially. Repurposing is gaining tremendous traction, as you would see. And that's exactly where we are well-placed to be thought leaders in informing what different repurposing options we could bring these mines back into and giving them a second life. So as we speak, many students, both in their individual capacity and also in groups, are working on variety of different projects and perhaps only future can tell how valuable information we can give it to the world. And yeah, I'm really excited about the outcomes of these research. Just to illustrate the range of other uses, I mean, on the energy side, there's also pumped storage hydro. So using two different abandoned occurrences right next to each other to generate energy from water. There's also reforestation efforts. There's an example in Indonesia where they're reforesting abandoned quarries to help protect against flooding. There's the biodiversity aspects and we have one such example in Melbourne where they turned an old quarry into the Royal Botanic Gardens at the edge of the city. A whole range of different types of plant species and water features around the area that people can then visit. So bringing in these kinds of natural solutions, recreational solutions and energy solutions into the mix and being able to then figure out what we can do for each occurrences of the 80,000 that we identified would be, I guess, a dream scenario as well. Absolutely. I'm so excited. In fact, we, both of us have supervised a number of students who did, as you rightly said, some people looked at whether we could use some of these abandoned quarries, which are within the metropolitan catchment to catch water and store water. Because as the Melbourne population is going to double by 2050, we're going to need a lot of water and we're going to need a lot of space to store the municipal solid waste that we generate. And I guess what's critical is to realize that not all these mines are just outside the city. There are some old occurrences that are smack bang in the middle of an urban area. 
And it's important to realize that we have opportunities there, especially since new space or existing redevelopment areas are under high competition and pressure for new developments. So it's almost like targeting these abandoned sites can provide some opportunities because the space in a way has been allocated and we can start to think strategically about how we then use that space for the benefit of the community. Spot on, because that's exactly your research area, right? Blue-green infrastructure. I, I'm really avidly following some of the spectacular videos that you do on YouTube. No, thank you. Yeah, it's an amazing kind of intersection of different ideas, how they can marry so well. Because, you know, mining and urban spaces, oh, like five years ago, no one even would think of it. But now that we both worked and we created so much of new knowledge, so people are turning their attention to what we are saying through these research pieces. Indeed. And I guess, you know, we've talked about some of these examples, like the biodiversity one, the botanical gardens, but it's also targeting more than just one benefit. You know, you've got the biodiversity benefit, but you also have the recreational benefit. Or in cases of reforestation, restoring that natural ecosystem system, but also helping prevent any potential flood risks in the immediate vicinity. So huge opportunities there. And I guess mm. coming to the city itself, and this is quoting from a book that you quote back in your 2009 paper by Jacobs in 1969, the cities of today are the minds of tomorrow. There you go. What's your take on that many years later after you wrote that paper and have reflected and are now venturing into this much richer and interesting strategic field that will affect our future? I think if you look at the case of of critical minerals, how different countries and different sovereign entities are trying to source is go back and redig some of the stuff that they left behind. And if you look at Century Zinc Mine, which is in Queensland, it's already closed. The tailings that belongs to Century Zinc Mine are going to be fourth largest zinc deposit in the world. In the tailings? Yeah, yeah. In a zinc mine? In a zinc mine that was Jeez. overdone and dusted. Wow. And likewise, Olympic Dam is one of the largest mines in South Australia, the rare earths that are part of the Olympic Dam tailings are going to be, if you are going by just mere number terms, are going to be second largest rare earth deposit. Wow. If they can recover all the rare earths that are part of their tailings, they can meet world's 40% rare earth demand. So again, this is only just a mining site, but also recycling wise, there are so many urban landfills which would have a number of these valuables. If you salvaged, they could offset some of primary production because we are going to need huge, huge quantities, staggering numbers. And we are going to be in shortfall of mm. majority of these materials, especially for climate change mitigation. Yeah, that's incredible. And so the research itself has progressed quite substantially. I know there's the discipline of urban mining as well, where they're looking at this waste recycling and or upcycling, even if we're going to use terms in circularity or circular economy. But, you know, that's the research side. What's interesting about you is that only few researchers have had the opportunity to really involve the government and to be able to communicate their work to the government. And you yourself have, through your illustrious career, have been able to testify in front of senates and government panels and to really create that change in policy. How do you go from creating that publication to then moving to that point where you can really influence a real change? This is the same piece of advice I keep giving to a lot of youngsters. You need to see things from a broader standpoint. I keep saying that one thing that you should do is begin with end in mind. So I've been always like that. Look at my example that I shared with you earlier in the show about creating artificial soils. Mm. These industries existed even before I went to work in Latro Valley, right? Yep. But it was me who brought them across the table and then, you know, we created a synergy and then created the soil. So that's where... My research was straight away influencing industry practice. So the crazy academic idea has become a technology today. Yeah, no, that is very true. A crazy academic idea of, you know, 2011 has become a technology by 2020, for example, let's say, or even 2019. And likewise, when these students were working on different states, as example, and then there was this opportunity to contribute to a Senate inquiry that was happening back in 2017. I think it was led by one of the Greens senator as the chair of the committee. Mainly what they were trying to do is it was a Senate standing committee on environment. Mine rehabilitation was one of the things that was referred to this Senate standing committee. So it was such an opportune time for us. A few students have done their projects and now federal government wants to understand what is the federal government's role in mine rehabilitation. So the committee task commenced in 2017. 
but I think it extended after a year or so, or maybe after a few months, they extended their scope to include even fly ash dams. And fortunately, I had one PhD student who was trying to look at what are the ways in which fly ash could be reused. So in the process, we also do a bit of mapping of all the fly ash dams in the country and try to understand what quantities exist in which place. So it was such a coincidence that our research was timely. And when the Senate inquiry was commissioned, we made several submissions to that. So some of them were written submissions, but some, like for example, there was a joint standing committee on foreign affairs, defense and trade. This was another committee, federal parliamentary committee, that when we were stuck with COVID. So trying to understand where things are going wrong, where we have good control on things, etc. And we submitted a white paper, mm. myself, Professor David Whittle, Professor Gavin Mard, and a few other colleagues. Some big names in the Australian industry, yep. And then we were asked to testify before the committee. So we said that, okay, these are the issues and this is how it could be dealt with. And you know, again, as I said earlier, we are very proud that our research is not only impacting on peers, but also on industry practice, but also most importantly on national and international policies. Yeah, I feel very proud about the kind of influence that we are able to make through our very practically relevant research. Mm. So I keep saying we are providing Practical solutions to practical problems are real solutions to real problems. And do you think we have definitely improved the, I guess, the stigma around the perceptions of mining or the bad reputation that it's earned? Or do you think we're in the right direction at least? Yeah, I think it takes time because when you have centuries of bad doing or not doing proper job, we are in the advocacy of, okay, let's do things this way. Let's do things in this way to correct so yes, the perception will change eventually. But again, I'm not talking that the current day miners don't do their job well, but it was that historical mining which created that bad legacy mm. uh, as far as mining is concerned. So through our research, we will continue to bring that last glory of mining industry. Definitely. And yeah, wishing you all the best. We only scratched the surface of a very fascinating and very deep pun intended, <laughs> of a very deep field. But uh, I hope that also through this discussion, we were able to also give the listeners some kind of idea of you know where it's heading and why the practice itself can be a very attractive field to go into as well because of the huge opportunities, not only within the field, but also the huge interdisciplinary opportunities as a springboard for combating a lot of the challenges we face in our world. There can't be any better time to be doing this research that we are doing than the current times. Definitely. Mohan, this has been a really fascinating and wide-ranging insight into the work you do, as well as a field that I feel I understand so much more about now compared to when we were working on it together at the time. I felt so out of place. I'd love to get into some of the questions I ask each and every guest so that listeners can learn a bit more about you, what drives you and some of the challenges you faced. And I guess you've told us a lot about your inspiration and why you got into the field. But what is it that drives you now every day you wake up and you want to tackle the next big challenge in the mining sector? Again, if you look at, you know, what inspires me is mining is so fundamental to human growth and prosperity and development. So it provides jobs, it provides rural development, it provides the energy needs, it provides the materials that we are going to need. So that is something that keeps me very, very exciting. You know, I am in, in an industry in a capacity to, in an advocacy role or in a kind of research that we do that informs both public policy and industry practice. So yeah, that keeps me very, very motivated every time I get up and I wanted to do more and better in this area. If you had a magic wand, so you could change one thing about the current practice and the current situation. And we've, I think, been through a lot of the challenges the practice faces. What would that be? Yeah, what I would do is probably I'll go and emphasize on that basic principle that begin with end in mind. So any mind before it even conceptualizes, I would say that can you go to understand how this entity could be reborn with what different hat on it? So that's the kind of thing that I would like to change. And I want to be one of the thought leaders in in that space. It's interesting to see because I guess I've had previous guests sort of really propose radical changes. To me, it seems like if we can just change that one mindset, keeping the end in mind from the very beginning, then everything else in a way will just fall in place naturally. Absolutely. No, it's fascinating to see. 
yeah, I think you are definitely a thought leader in that field. And I think with, with some of the impact you've made, you know, not just in the research, but also in the practice, it's only a matter of time, I think, before people really start to develop that mindset. I feel very privileged to be in this position of uh, being able to not only inform the policy, but also being part of the change that we want to see in the society, which is really satisfying to me at the end of the day. Hmm. Is there a key moment, book, event, or person that has completely changed the course of your career or mindset? Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the key thing is, you know, there are so many factors that I've already sort of said about what motivated me to take mining as my career. Perhaps the most crucial being one of my cousin brothers. He was a mining engineer by then. He was studying his mining engineering at uh, Kothagoram School of Mines was not only inspiration, but he was really a thought leader and also a change leader for me. My entire life kind of took different turns just because of him. And he was pursuing his undergraduate studies in mining engineering at the same school where I went to study. And that motivated me to take mining as my career. Besides my other siblings, my sisters supporting me to do engineering as a career, because that's when people were highly employable. And that's where people always wanted to be so that they become better paid and better employable and so on and so forth. So yes, Mr. Ramana Purkanti was one of the inspirations who inspired me to take mining as my discipline. As I said, from my humble beginnings from a very rural kid growing up in India, when I saw that the area that I see today was once a very lush green, pristine, untapped ecosystem. By the time I became a student of engineering studying at a university, the whole area became heaps of degraded landscapes and heaps of spoil put everywhere, open cuts, mm. huge destruction. So that is one thing that changed I should be doing something better to, you know, change the image, not only image of the industry, but also the practices in which the industry conduct itself. So that was one of the important change moments that led to what I do today. In a way, preserving or restoring that childhood memory that you remember so fondly and being able to protect that at all costs. Absolutely. And yeah. like the very first fundamental principle of sustainable development is it's not that you inherited, but you borrowed and you have the same responsibility to pass on to your next generation. Mm. In a, if not in the way that you borrowed, maybe you have more responsibility to give it to them in a better way than what you got yeah. from your ancestors. And we should strive for intergenerational equity, if not even better. Absolutely. Definitely agree. And on that note, what was one of the most challenging situations that you have ever faced in your career to date? And how did you overcome it? Yeah, that is a very interesting question. You know, Peter, as I said, I used to be doing all this fantastic research work. But, you know, the system that we are in, in fact, pre-COVID and during COVID, I was under tremendous pressure because I was teaching four units at the university. Four units is almost one FTE. But my mind, for some reason, doesn't stop thinking creatively. Yeah. And that's where I used to get excited about this space that, you know, the mind rehabilitation and think globally, act locally kind of thing. So I was one way passionate, but at the same time, you know, I had to do this teaching of four units. And again, I had seven PhD students at the same time oh my while I was God. doing all this. So imagine what I was going through. Oh boy. And yeah, I think that was most toughest period. I had to go through tremendous amount of competing pressures. And I thank my wife, who was always with me to keep me going. And many colleagues in the department also helped me at the time. So that was one of the toughest challenges that I faced in my career so far. But you didn't have to face it alone, which was, I guess, the comforting thought about it. Absolutely. I mean, just to illustrate, if you're teaching four units, four different courses at university, that's, you know, you have preparation time, you get your lecture time, you have the student feedback. So as you said, one FTE or full-time equivalent, it's like 100% of your time. And then you have to do all the other stuff in addition to that. And I guess, yeah, you got to find what drives you and in a way being realistic about it and knowing at the same time, academia is about collaboration, that you're not alone in this whole process as well. And also one thing that I want to make it clear to our viewers is when I was teaching that four units, that is a time when university had to cut down a lot of staff. And that means a lot of admin load in teaching, learning practices also came on to academics. Generally, on average, an academic would teach only two units at university, but I was teaching double the load. 
and on top of which you know all the admin responsibilities etc so that was one of the most agonizing or torturous times that i had to go through in my career but i guess one thing that came out of it were a lot of the students that ended up working on research projects together with you and the collaboration we had as well absolutely that's a very positive i think god has been always kind to me so whenever i was in trouble he always sent me he or she you know i don't know what the gender that i should use for god but uh, yeah almighty had been always so kind that some good friends and colleagues came to my rescue like yourself for example guess there's always a silver lining and it's important to stay positive in these kinds of times especially when they get tough absolutely yeah but again no day is going to remain permanently so there's always next day so that's the one hope that i used to always live by yeah. and i used to live by just that moment definitely live in the present i guess that's important and knowing tomorrow is another opportunity mm. what tips and strategies can you offer in terms of time management so how do you maintain a balance between your profession and personal time. Yeah, again, this is very important for everyone because as much I do put my heart and soul into my work, I also never neglect going for outing, going relaxing. See, for example, recently I returned from a family holiday from Cooper PD. Oh, nice. So we, we drove about 6000 kilometers, three of us, my wife's son and myself. They're famous for opals, right? Yes. we went all the way to uluru and then it was such a spectacular family time so yeah you need a balance between how much you put as work and you know a bit of relaxation time so what i would say is the best thing is always aim for low hanging fruits and also when i say low hanging fruits invest your time in high impact and high consequence kind of activities for example when we did this database paper it is one paper but it's created so much national and international impact i've been approached by people from all over the world for this small piece of work incredible so that's one thing that i strongly recommend so look at what is that high impact thing that you can do with a minimum investment of time or of course maybe you know modest investment of time i think that's where people should invest they call it in other places the 80 20 principle doing the the 20% that produces 80% of the results you could say first and then yeah just being strategic with your time and the decisions you make low hanging fruits certainly something that i tend to look at as well if i need to develop some outputs but also create the big your impact later on and they say small steps absolutely small steps lead you to the big outcome can't disagree so what other advice can you offer to young engineers starting out think globally act locally that's one of the important mantras that i want to pass on the second one is system thinking so that's where i said ask yourself why you are doing what you're doing if you can't think you can't act you know that uh, this principle about think globally act locally my two examples of whether that industry practice that i changed or my research has changed looking at four industries in a electro valley region so that's thinking globally but acting locally for mining industry same with uh, public policy kind of macro level understanding okay what are those regional synergies unless you understand where the mines are what the problems are again if you look at the title of our own paper that we co-authored is a geospatial database for effective mine rehabilitation in australia so geospatial is you are trying to understand what exists where so first of all defining the problem is crucial in before solving it if i may say i think you need to have that why in the back of your head before you even start be very sure about it and then i think you'll be able to defend your research or your ideas in the best way possible and you can bring people on board because then they understand your reasoning true that's very very important again begin with the end in mind go back to that <laughs> so they all are so so important fundamental principles they may sound a bit uh, absurd but if you really understand the intent they mean a lot yeah definitely where can people find you if they want to get in touch so i work at monash university I got a web profile and I'm very active on LinkedIn. I don't use a Twitter or any other things, but I am very active on LinkedIn, but also my university Monash University profile is quite prominent and people reach out to me quite often through both LinkedIn as well as through my Monash. I think these are the two best sources that people can reach out to me. And we'll definitely put that in the show notes so if people want to get in touch, they certainly can. but it's been a wonderful time having this discussion with you and learning a lot more about you and also just the whole practice of mining and resource engineering but just before i give you the final word i do have one burning question which is since the you know the beginning of your origin story how's your cricket oh good question uh P- peter unfortunately as much i love my cricket but i can't play because what happened is i think um just before covid i twisted my ankle oh no so 
it's really so painful that I miss my cricket. But also, you know, we must understand as I grow old, I can't have the same amount of reflexes that I used to have when I was in 20s. So I think uh, that's when I said, okay, it's time that uh, I should retire from cricket. Otherwise, Aww. something else I will endure and then, you know, it could be catastrophic. So I think that's where I stopped. But you've got a beautiful path you chose instead. So all the best with that. So like I do with every guest on the show, I always give you the final words. So Mohan, one last message for the listeners to take away from today. Yeah, so it's uh, wonderful to be in a career at the right time because mining has been one of the favorite subjects for me. And it is so much so because it supplies so many materials that we want to need. And we are in an era where responsible mining is the way to go. Without mining, we can't meet climate change targets. So we must continue to mine, but we all should be mining mindfully. Do mindful mining. Thank you very much. And thank you to you listeners for tuning in to this broad discussion with wonderful insights with Mohan Yelishetti. For your fantasy cricket needs, recipes for producing your own electronics, or more insights into where we should dig sustainably, check out the show notes over at peterambach.com slash podcast. If you enjoyed this show and are looking forward to more episodes, please do subscribe. Follow this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Music, or wherever you are listening from to be notified of the latest release as soon as it becomes available. Leave a review or pass this on to your friends and family to spread the beautiful messages from our many great guests. If you're curious about me or my work in general, you can also check out my website or social media. Head to peterembach.com, my YouTube channel, Peter Marcus Bach, that's Marcus with a C, or follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Peter and Bach, or Instagram at Peter and Bach 87 Thank you very much for all your support so far. If you have feedback or suggestions, or just know someone who has an inspiring story to offer, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. The podcast intro and outro song is called Breaking Sweat by Balloon Planet. Stay tuned for our next episode and next guests to hear how they are tackling the grand challenges.